Welcome back to Historical Geology. Today I want to talk about chapter 13, which deals with vertebrates and plants of the Paleozoic. And this is, this is a famous trackway in Ireland that dates back to 365 million years ago, which is about Middle Devonian. And it's important because it documents a tetrapod. Trackways of a tetrapod, meaning that there are four-legged creatures leaving the seas and beginning to explore the land. Back in about 2005, researchers in Poland found another trackway that dates back about maybe 20 million years earlier to the early Devonian, 395 million years ago. Here they envisioned a tetrapod that was about eight feet long that was making this trackway. So certainly Devonian is also marking the time of organisms beginning to move on to land. So why would they need limbs? They want to be able to move in streams and swamps and shallow waters because plants are beginning to populate the land and there's a food source there. The earliest vertebrate is Cambrian. And this is an early vertebrate, maybe a, a related to fish, but one thing that it does have, it does have that notochord and that dorsal hollow tube there and it has a gill slits. Uh, again, it has a bilateral symmetry. Vertebrates are related to echinoderms in terms of their cell cleavage. We see where the cell cleavage is that both echinoderms and vertebrates have the radial cell cleavage, whereas all other invertebrates have this spiral cell cleavage. Also, the biochemistry and the muscular activity and blood proteins are similar at larval stage. There's a little cartoon showing how this radial symmetry works compared to the spiral symmetry. For fish, the, they're the most primitive vertebrate, and they can date back to the Cambrian about 525 million years ago. We find them in Wyoming in the dogwood formation there. Agnatha means jawless, and the first jawless fish are called the ostracoderms. They are now extinct, but that was the first jawless fish. We begin to see freshwater fish in the Silurian. So really, they start off in the, in the marine environment, the seawater, and then they move to freshwater by Silurian time. Looking a little bit at taxonomy, there's some important groups. The order here, Agnatha, which means jawless. There's still some Agnatha fish around today, the lamprey and the hagfish, but the Cambrian and Ordovician uh, species are called the ostracoderms. They're the ones that are extinct. They were armored and jawless. There's another species called the Canthodonians. These were also armored, but they started getting jaws. So these are going to be jawed fish, armored fish. And then we see placoderms, which are armored fish. They're very large, and they were really dominant in the Devonian. Uh, they went extinct by the end of the Permian. And then the two classes we're familiar with are the chondrichthys, which are the sharks, rays, and skates. And then osteichthys are the bony fish. And the actinopterygii are like tuna, raffin fish, catfish. Uh, the most important group out of the uh, actinopterygii are the teleos fish. Then there is Sarcopterygii. These are important because these are the ones that have the lobe fin. And the Crossopterygians really are the ones that probably evolved into amphibians. So keeping lobe fin fish. Figure 13.1 or table 13.1 in your book is important. Make sure to look at it and, and determine when these species, uh, like Acanthodonians, went extinct in the Permian. Placoderms went extinct in the Permian. And then we have the bony fish. Arctinopterygii and Sarcopterygii. I talked about those already. And here's a, the oscoderms, right? Bottom dwelling, jawless fish. The way they fed, they just sucked up detritus. For the acanthodonians, now we're starting to see the jaws. Lower Selenian acanthodonians, the way the jaws develop, they develop from these gill arches. And these acanthodonians are probably ancestors to the bony fish, the osteichthys. And so the evolution of the jaw is really these first two gill arches developed into a jaw. And probably the reason is because there are other food resources around that require teeth. And also the bigger the mouth opening, the more oxygen you can pass through the gills, the more metabolism, the faster the fish can be. In terms of the placoderms, these are these armored fish. And some of them got huge. The famous armored placoderm is Dunkleostis. And Dunkleosis got up to 12 meters long. They were predators of these uh, Devonian epiric seas. Also, Devonian is called the Age of Fish. So the last two that developed in the Devonian are the chondrichthys, with the sharks, and the osteichthys, the bony fish. So here's some cartilaginous fish here. And then the bony fish. Remember, there are two classes, the actinopterygii, the raffin fish, which are the common teleos fish we see in the ocean. 
The Sarcopterygii are not as common, but they're the lobe fin fish. They're going to have this kind of fleshy appendage and then have the fins at the end. And what we find with these lobe fin fish, they do have a primitive rift structure and sort of appendage uh, structure in each of these lobe fins. So there are three orders of Sarcopterygii, the lobe fin fish. Now, the coelacanth, these are kind of amazing. They're found in the fossil record, and people thought they were extinct, but back in the 1930s, some coelacanth fossils were found in Madagascar, and apparently there's a community of these living in the Indian Ocean today. So that's like a living fossil there. The dipnoi lungfish, they have a modified swim bladder, so they can kind of move from one lake to another, or bury themselves and wait for the water to return. And then the crossopterygians, those are the lobe fin fish, and remember the suborder of these crossopterygian ripsidians, those are the ones that probably led to the evolution of amphibians. And these fish went extinct by the end of the Permian. So these ripsidian crossopterygians appear to be the ancestral group of these labyrinthodonts, and the labyrinthodonts are the amphibians. And if you compare the tooth structure, it's kind of a labyrinth, they're identical to the ripsidian fish. So, and also when you look at the bone structure and the wrists of a of a ripsidian, you can find those same bones in the labyrinthodont amphibian here. So these amphibians, they follow the plants, insects, spiders on the land. It's a food resource. Uh, what are some of the water to land barriers? Well, they're concerned with desiccation, reproduction. Now they don't have the water to hold them up, so they have to develop muscles to work against gravity. And they have to figure out how to breathe air from the atmosphere. So the traditional sequence was it was Ripsidian to Ichthyostega. And Ichthyostega was like about a nine foot long amphibian, one of these labyrinthodonts. And there's many new fossils that have been found that really link these Ripsidian fish to the labyrinthodonts. So here's some Ichthyostega, Upper Devonian fossils in Greenland, fish-like fin tails, they're tetrapods, so four-legged, right? They have the ridge cage, pelvis, pectoral girdles, so they have some muscle attachment there, and they really diversified in this Carboniferous period. A new fossil link, Tiktaalik, discovered in 2006 up in Canada. It's a fish with wrist bones. It can maneuver in, in vegetated swamps, dates 375 million years ago, and it's called a fishapod. It's really a perfect link between those lobe fin fish and then the reptiles that we see on land. These late Paleozoic amphibians, they were big, like I said, you know, six feet to up to nine feet long. They lived in swamps, streams, they ate fish, vegetation, smaller amphibians, and they're abundant in the Carboniferous. But one of the problems, they had to stay near water because they laid gelatinous eggs. One thing about amphibians, they need, they need a water source to lay their eggs in. For reptiles, the big evolutionary step was development of the amniote egg. And this amniote egg enabled the reptile to lay her eggs on land away from a water source because that egg had everything the embryo needed. Primarily, it needed this yolk sac for nutrients. And essentially, as the embryo grew, it grew into a small adult. There was no larval stage. And when it hatched, it looked like an adult. And then it just grew to the size of, its, of the adults. So there was no need for it to return to water. When we're looking at the evolution of reptiles, there is some protorotherid, and the protorotherid would be the stem reptile, and it evolved from some labyrinthodont, some amphibian. The thing about reptiles, they have advanced jaws and teeth, and again, they have that tough skin where they can move away from water. And we'll find that there are two branches for these uh, reptiles. There's the uh, synapsids, or Polycosaurus therapsids. These eventually led to mammals, Therapsids are also known as mammal-like reptiles. And then the, the Thicodontians, or the Thicodonts, and these eventually led to reptiles, snakes, and others. Now looking at the Polycosaurs, famous Dimetrodon was a finback Polycosaur that, of the Permian period. And again, the word synapsid refers to having one hole behind its eye socket. There's also therapsids, again, the mammal-like reptiles. They evolved from polycosaurs. They had the very dentition, teeth for nipping, tearing, and chewing. And instead of having their legs really widely spread out, they started having their legs more under their body. And it seemed like they would be endothermic, would give birth to live young as well. And a famous therapsid is predator of the Permian time, 
called a Gorgon Gorgonopsis. Gorgonopsis were about the size of a bear, maybe about 12 to 14 feet long. So they were one of the predators of the Permian period. Now for the Thecodonts, the Thecodont means socket tooth. And one thing that all these, especially dinosaurs with the share is all their teeth are the same. They just may be different sizes, but they're all about the same. They're diapsid. So diapsid refers to two holes behind the eye hole. So that differentiates them from synapsids. Now you'll see that for the thecodonts, we have lizards, snakes, the tatuara, which is found in New Zealand primarily, and the archosaurs. The important group here is the archosaurs, which includes dinosaurs, crocodiles, and birds. So crocodiles, the saurischian di dinosaurs, and the ornithischian dinosaurs, and the birds all belong to archosaurs. Note that pterosaurs and other marine reptiles, they're just reptiles.